Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine, and today we're on Topic 7, Lesson 2 on T-Tests. Before I begin, I want to discuss something concerning our last lesson on Z-Tests, and particularly this lesson. And that is that I'm, at this point in the class, playing a little fast and loose with the underlying math and probability theory behind uh, the statistics we'll be going through, and that's going to be true for the rest of the class. The reason that I'm doing that is because I want you to get a conceptual and visual understanding of the statistics rather than a mathematical one. Uh, again, this class is for anthropologists. Most of you are not particularly fond of mathematics, and so I don't want to really be getting into that or probability theory. Z-scores or Z-tests are fairly straightforward. And if you understand the Z-test, I think you can understand the T-test. Mathematically, they're very different. And in terms of the underlying probability theory, they're very different. I'm not going to go through that. And in general, I'm going to present T-tests very much like Z-tests. And so in both cases, I'm, I'm trying to convey this much more conceptually than I am in terms of the, the accurate mathematics or probability theory. So, if you want to understand these mathematically, you're going to need to go uh, into a, a higher level kind of statistics course or a, a math-oriented statistics course. And just understand that what I'm doing is conceptual and that the mathematics really, we're, we're beyond them now. So try and just understand the idea behind these and what the, what the output, the, the computer output, what you actually are going to get uh, out of a computer because we're not calculating anything anymore. We've gone well beyond that at this point in the course. So. With that caveat, let's move forward. So here's a distribution. We've seen this a bunch of times, right? And we've learned about z-scores and how we can use z-scores to look at percentages uh, in terms of an individual and where they are in a population and all of that. Okay. We are almost never going to use z-tests or or Z scores in terms of our actual research, although we'll use standardized scores in terms of um, trying to create a more usable uh, distribution, as we've talked about earlier in the course. Um, but in terms of Z tests, you probably are never going to use one in your career. You may never read about one because. Z-tests are based on the assumption that you are comparing a person to a population. And we basically never deal with populations. Uh, I talked about this earlier in the course when we talked about samples. Even when we think we have a full population, it really is a defined, almost arbitrary thing. And really what we're dealing with is samples. We, we never have the full range of what we could call a population. And even within that, as we measure things, we're usually dealing with samples. We, we build samples up from different cultures, for example. And so really any case that we might use in a distribution, as is shown here, is really pretty much a sample. So we're looking at distributions that are made up of samples much more than cases, and we're really never looking at uh, a population, we're looking at a sample. And what that means is if we take, as we did in the last uh, lesson, sad me, and we look at them in terms of a sample that's really kind of not fair, and we almost never have an individual we're looking at. What we typically have is a population of individuals, a sample, sorry, I said population. See, I even get these terms wrong. Uh, 
what we typically have is a sample of individuals, and this might be a group of people we've surveyed, uh, or a, a, a culture that's made up of lots of different people, and so we're comparing that to another sample or sets of samples. And when we're doing that, z-test is not appropriate. And so the reason that you almost never are going to use a z-test is because you are almost never going to be comparing an individual against a population. The only time you might be doing that is in some kind of artificial context where you have a normative, established, uh, set of criteria. IQ tests are one of these. Uh, standard scores on SAT and things like that and that's why you can put yourself or another person in a percentile. But in terms of a test of significance, you're almost never going to do that. What you're going to do is a t-test. And the assumptions are going to be that you have a sample and you're comparing one sample against another sample. Okay? We use t-tests for almost all those kinds of comparisons. The t-test, because it's a sample versus a sample, can't use a population mean and an individual mean. What you're comparing is a sample mean with another sample mean. And what that means is you don't really have a population to compare sample against. What you have is a set of samples, and you're comparing a sample against it. This is a little confusing, right? But, but think about that. So in fact, what you're using as your population is something that we call a distribution of means. If we go back to look at a population, this is a distribution of individuals. Or in this case, what we're looking at it is conceptually, right? Conceptually is a distribution of samples. When we think about doing a distribution of samples, we think about this in terms of a distribution of means. And so we have something that is called a distribution of means. All right. In a distribution of means, the sample mean is identical, or it becomes, sorry, the sample mean becomes what's called the mean of the distribution of means. That's a mouthful, isn't it? So we have a sample mean. In the distribution of means, that becomes the mean of the distribution of means. In other words, it's the mean of all the sample means. Okay. Instead of having standard deviation, right, which within a sample we have a standard deviation, we have what's called the standard error of the mean. It's the same thing, but it's the standard deviation of the distribution of means. Go back then. How do we get this distribution of means? This is where the math becomes really complicated because we have to have calculus. But here's what we do. We take this sample, and out of that sample we take an infinite number of samples within that sample. Okay? We can do an infinite number using um, calculus. We take an infinite number of samples and then we plot the means. So in a sense, as we can go back, sorry, going back pretty far to this, we take these little samples, we take an infinite number of them, and then we take the means and we plot them out. And what we'll get is a distribution of means. Each sample we plot the means, we get a distribution of means. Okay? It's a concept that's very hard to, sometimes to get, but think about that. We take an infinite number of samples from this sample, we plot them out, and we get a distribution of means. All right. Mean becomes mean of the distribution of means, 
standard deviation becomes the standard error of the mean. And here's a couple of things that are nice. One, the mean of the sample is the same as the mean of the distribution of means. And think of why that would be. If you take an infinite number of samples out of here, you're going to just sort of recreate that here. So whatever the mean of this set of samples is, it'll be the same mean because you're still going to be taking the samples out of here, if you're random sampling, at the same proportion as they are in the, in the whole sample. And so the mean is going to be the same, right? However, Oh, sorry. The standard deviation here is always going to be larger than the standard error of the mean. Okay, so this again is mathematically maybe difficult to think about, but conceptually, you're taking means out of here. And so the means are going to be a smaller range of numbers. And so the standard error of the mean is going to be small. OK. Just keep that in mind. t-test, then, is we're comparing some sample against the distribution of means. And what we're going to have as the t-test, and this is very similar to a z-test, and that's what I want you to think conceptually. And that's why I did z-test first. t-test is like a z-test. But instead of using the mean, we use the mean of the distribution of means. Instead of using standard deviation, we use the standard error of the mean. So a t-test is the mean of whatever our sample is minus the mean of the distribution of means divided by the standard error of the mean. Simple as that. Z-test was case minus mean over standard deviation. This is mean minus mean of the distribution of means divided by the standard error, which is essentially the standard deviation of the distribution of means. It's a lot of words. I hope you understand that if you don't go back and listen to this again or read your text again. The thing that is specifically different between a t-test and a z-test comes out of probability theory. And because we're working with samples, the size of the sample, and we've talked about this before, the size of the sample is determines sort of the, the spread and accuracy from which we can estimate the means. But it really determines the spread. If we've got a small sample, we tend to have a big spread. And if we have a bigger sample, we have a better idea of how the population we're interested in actually looks. And, and in probability theory, and again, we don't need to get into this very much. And frankly, I'm not a mathematician. I only have a superficial understanding of probability theory that goes back 30 years to my graduate student days. So I understand this conceptually as well. The, the distribution that we actually are sampling from changes depending on how many cases we are using in our sample. So that if we have a sample that's really small, we, the, the tails actually contain a greater percentage than if we have a really big sample. So here, the blue is a normal distribution with an infinite number of cases, essentially. The red has a smaller number of cases. And you can see there's more in the tail and less in the middle. And if we get to a very small sample, like this green one, there's a lot of cases in the tail. And so in terms of determining how much is in the tail and where a 0.5% critical value, a value of alpha, is, we need to take into account the degrees of freedom, the size of the sample.
And so if we, we looked last time at a table of z-scores, and it was basically a set of numbers with the z-score, and then if we have a critical value, where that particular z-score sits, how much of the population is, is below that. When we look at t-scores in a similar table, those numbers vary by the degrees of freedom. And so let me show you. If we have a degrees of freedom of five, so we have five cases in the samples that we're using, the critical value of t at 0 0.05 is 2.57. So think of that as a z-score, sort of, 2.57 z's, but these are t-scores, but they're equipped, they're Think of them conceptually as being equivalent, t-score being like a z-score. If, if we have five cases in our sample, the critical value t-score, the value we have to be less than in order to be part of the population or greater than in order to be less than alpha. And what do we do when we have a... Uh, value less than alpha, a probability less than alpha, that's when we reject the null hypothesis. Oh my God, your, your brains are exploding, right? Get used to this. Go back over the lessons, read the text. It, it, it can be very confusing. So let me do this again. T value is like a z-score, right? T value is like a z-score, And as we get farther away from the middle, we get t values that are bigger and bigger and bigger, just like, or farther away from the mean. We get t values that are bigger and bigger and bigger. But the t value that is the critical alpha value of 0 0.05, if that's what we're doing, and that's what we're doing here, 0.05. The t value is bigger if the sample smaller sizes are smaller because there's more cases in the tails in smaller sample sizes. And so the critical value of t in order to reject the null hypothesis, which is when the probability of getting that t value is less than 0 0.05, is greater when we have smaller samples because there's more cases in the tail. Okay? Listen to that again if you, if you need to. If we have five cases, the critical value of t is 2.57. With 10, it goes down to 2.23. With 30, it goes down to 2.04. With 100, it goes down to 1.98. And if we have an infinite number, it's 1.96. That would be plus or minus. But Notice that by the time you get to about 30 cases, it pretty much starts leveling off. And that's why I've said that to do statistics, a sample size of 30 is adequate. And, and, and in anthropological research, that's actually a pretty good sample size. It's hard to get a whole lot bigger than that, especially if you're doing cross-cultural research. If you're doing archaeology, you're dependent on what you find. If you can get 30 cases, you can start doing some reasonable statistical analysis. If you have less than that, it starts getting a little bit more difficult. Um, if you have more, that's fine. But this is the reason why 30 cases uh, is a useful number, because the t values start leveling off. And when we look at other statistics based on probability, that's when things start becoming kind of stable. All right, I've just gone through a lot of mind-bending material. We're going to take a short break. If you need to, go back and look at this again. You might want to look at the z-score lesson again. I, I'd like you to be now at a place where you're comfortable thinking about z-tests and t-tests and conceptually again what's going on here, that we're taking a number, subtracting it from a mean, and dividing by a standard deviation. But when we use samples, 
we have the sample mean and then we have the mean of the distribution of means and we have the standard deviation of the distribution of means which is called the standard error of the mean so we're basically taking a t-test and shifting it into a context where we're looking at samples rather than uh, cases okay we'll be back in a minute So, what I just told you is not actually how we do t-tests most of the time. And I'm sorry that I keep pulling the rug out from under you, but what I'm trying to do is sort of walk you through what's conceptually kind of difficult material. What we just did is called a one-sample t-test, and essentially it's just like a z-test. And I did that because you already know z-tests, we can put it in the same context, and I hope you understood what was going on uh, with that. In fact, when you get a big enough sample, a z-test and a one-sample t-test are basically the same thing. And so it's easy to sort of begin thinking about t-tests using that. We're going to move on to what you're going to see t-tests used for much more frequently, and basically how how they're always used, which is what are called two-sample tests. And in two-sample tests, what you're really trying to see is whether those two samples, or whether two samples that you have, are actually part of the same larger sample, or whether they've been drawn from different samples. We could call that a larger population, or whether they're drawn from two different populations. Um, there are two different ways that we might do that. In a true experiment, like we talked about in the last topic, you would have paired samples, or what are called dependent samples. You would have, they would be matched on some criteria, or they might be the same group of people. They undergo some kind of treatment, and then you look at the effect, and what you're going to look at is whether the the sample of the people before the effect and the sample after have changed. In anthropology, we, because we don't do experiments very often, we do natural experiments or naturalistic experiments, we usually have independent samples. We have a group of people from this culture and a group of people from this culture, and we're trying to look at whether they're drawn from the same larger population. Usually in t-tests, the null hypothesis is that there is no difference, that the two samples are drawn from the same greater, larger sample or larger population. I'm going to use population because it just helps us to think about that. But remember, we almost never have a population. What we call a population is defined by a set of strict criteria. So it's really a a criterion-based population. The null hypothesis is usually in a t-test that there's no difference. So that those two samples are drawn from the same larger population. And then the research hypothesis is usually that the two are drawn from different populations. Okay? So let's look at this visually. Conceptually, already done, kind of, we're going to look at this visually. So, let's say that this is two samples. We've got one group of people that, had, that, that have not received a treatment and another group of people that have received a treatment. And these might be people at one time, then they get treated, and then they, that's at the other time. Or they might have been matched on a group of important criteria, their age, their gender, their socioeconomic status, their health, whatever. And then one received the treatment and one didn't. And what we want to look at is, have they changed? Which you can think about as, are they, is the treated one still part of the original population or have they changed significantly? So what we do in this is what I showed you last time, is that we take an infinite number of samples from this sample, and we get a distribution of the means. 
And we do that again from the other sample. And then, and this is the next step, we basically do that again from the two distribution of means, and we combine that into a sort of combined distribution of the means. Okay. That makes sense because the means are the same. And so we can estimate what this should be if these two come from the same population. We can also estimate what the standard error of this should be from the standard error of those two distribution of means. If the estimates are different from what we should be able to estimate, then it tells us that one population is different. And so what we end up doing is comparing the original samples to this, those original means, looking at their standard deviations and say, well, we've estimated what a population from which these two might have been drawn at random. Now let's look at them again and see whether that estimated population is what these two actually fit in. And if one of them doesn't fit into that estimated population, then they're different. So again, conceptually think about this. We are using the two original samples first and then the one that received a treatment or first one and then after they've received a treatment to estimate what a random population, what, what a population based just on the probability with these means and those standard deviations, what a, what a population would look like that both of those exist within. And then we go back and ask, do both of those actually fit in this estimated population? And we can do that estimation because we know that the means should be the same and the standard errors should be similar. If they're from the same population, the mean should be the same and the standard deviation or standard error should be similar to the standard deviation in the populations. In a sense, then, this is like a z-test, right, that we did before, only looking at two populations against sort of this created population. And then we're looking at two individuals sort of against that created population. If you remember, we did this with sad me and happy me when we were doing z-tests. So that's what's going on here. Let me show you another example with independent samples which is something like this. We have two populations, or two samples. I'm sorry, see, I even do this, like I said. We have two samples, one from, let's say, one culture, one from another culture. Are those drawn from the same larger population or not? We go through this process where we create out of them an, an estimated what well, we create a distribution of means. And then we estimate what population those might have come from. And then we actually look back and say, well, did those actually come from the same population? Or is one really different when we go back and look at the original sample? And if you remember, we looked in z-scores at SADME. And SADME was very different. Happy me fell right within. And so we can think of that as this being the same picture. There's happy me with its mean well within the distribution of means. If we were thinking of z scores here, well within the middle z scores on that unique artificial calculated population called the distribution of means. And this one, sad me well outside of it. And so we'd say this population is different. This population falls under, again, this is a calculated, an estimated, what the population should look like 
if these both were drawn from the same population. These two samples were drawn from the same population. Got that? And in this case, they're, it's different just like when we looked at z-scores. Again, I'm greatly simplifying this because I want you to understand it both conceptually, and I think this is a little difficult, but this I think helps you look at this. That goes to that and these go together to create this artificial or calculated or estimated uh, population. And we don't need to go into the mathematics of that. Okay. Complicated, right? So we're going to take another short break. If you need to, go back and look at this again. And then what I'm going to do is give you an example after the break that I hope will clarify this. Okay? We'll see you in a few minutes. So, I hope you've had a chance to go back and look at the lesson again, maybe even look at your text, understand t-tests, understand how they are similar to z-tests but also a little different. We're going to move on now to an example, and this is Boaz's Immigrant Study. Yes, I know, but we will never get away from Boaz. Boaz is the man. Remember that the immigrant study was created in a sense to test race theory. And if we remember this, there's a battle going on in early anthropology between whether race is what we can use to understand variation or whether culture or environment or something else. It wasn't well defined at the time, but culture helps to explain variation. Under race theory, then, behavior is essentially genetic. It is directly associated with race. Under culture theory, um, behavior is associated with culture or environment or history or something else, but it is not genetic. It's not directly inherited. So. In race theory, we would have a null hypothesis, I mean, a research hypothesis that racial characteristics are stable through generations, right? Because if behavior is associated with race, then race should be a stable thing, right? Or if behavior changes, race categories should end up changing first. And then those lead to behavioral changes because race is the predictive thing. The null hypothesis under race theory is that racial characteristics do not, are, are not stable, they're not heritable, they change over time, because then if they change over time, we basically get behavioral chaos, right? Because race is changing from generation to generation, then behavior and stuff is going to change in a culture constantly. And, and so race theory can't work if races are not something that are definable and stable. So what Boaz is attempting to do is look specifically at one element of race, and that is the cephalic index. This is the dependent variable. Cephalic index, we've talked about, and if you remember, it has to do with the roundness of the head. Rounder heads have a cephalic index close to one. Longer heads have a cephalic index further away than actually 100, because it's the index times 100. So rounder heads closer to 100, longer heads less than 100. And longer heads are thought to be smarter people because they have more frontal lobes in theory. Physiologically, we know now that that's not true, but at the turn of the century when all this is being debated, that was the idea. And then behavior is associated or suggested in, in under race theory that it's associated with intelligence. And intelligence is directly associated with the length of the skull because of the amount of frontal lobes. 
that you can have. Um, it's very interesting that the skull was one of the things most focused on by race theorists and basically what race was based on and is today as a social category is based on facial features. It's based on skin color, on hair form, on nose shape and form, lip shape and form. Those are the things that are most uh, commonly looked at as we define races. And that's interesting in terms of genetics because we would be equally likely to find that somehow the bones of the ankle are vary or the number of lobes or size of lobes in the liver. But we don't use those as racial characteristics. Why? Because we can't see them. Race is a way to identify in-group and out-group. It is a social category. It is a way that we as primates recognize members of our own species, our own group. It's not a category that is biologically meaningful or that is directly heritable from parent to child in the sense of being correlated with lots of other stuff. There certainly are things that are inherited, skin color, hair form. If they weren't inherited, we wouldn't be able to use those as ways to identify races. But those are superficial compared to everything else that makes us humans. So race theory doesn't work biologically, and it doesn't work um, as a way to explain behavior. But at the turn of the century, that was the theory. And cephalic index, for whatever reason, skulls were a big focus of race theory. So that's a dependent variable, is, is the cephalic index. What it's dependent on in Boaz's test is whether you were born in the U.S. or not. Now, the null hypothesis is that the cephalic index will change. Okay, that's different from what I said null hypotheses in t-tests usually are, but in this case, the, the assumption is that there's no change. The assumption is that the cephalic index is stable because it's inherited directly generation to generation through a race. The null hypothesis then under race theory is that cephalic index is going to change, right, because that's the opposite of what we actually think, that the, the cephalic index will not change. That would be the research assumption. The cephalic index is stable. That's the research, the hypothesis. If race theory is right, the cephalic index is stable. If it's wrong, it's going to change. Okay. Boaz is doing an independent samples test. Now, to be fair, he's not really doing a t-test the way we're doing it now. Um, his statistics were quite different than ours, and there actually has been a lot of analysis of them and some debate about what, whether what he actually found, his conclusions, whether they were accurate or not. But um, it's, it's settled down into, the, yeah, they were accurate, especially with the tools he had at the time, which is the 1910s and teens. Okay, so here are charts of foreign-born individuals, and U.S.-born individuals, and their cephalic indices. So this is one sample, foreign-born individuals, their cephalic index, U.S.-born individuals, and their cephalic index. We're looking at the means. They're slightly different. This is about 83. The mean here is about 81. The spread is different. <clears throat> the cephalic index there uh, spreads more. Over here there are some cases that are pretty long in the foreign born. There aren't as many here. Um, so there, the, the spread is a little different and you can see that this is slightly skewed that way, uh, 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 well this way, so that there's a slight skew to having some uh, 
longer heads, whereas this is pretty even. But in general, they're pretty good, normal distributions. And so we can use a t-test looking at these two independent samples and see, are they drawn from the same larger population or not? And here's what we find. The mean for US individuals is 81.85. The mean for foreign born individuals is 83.34. And these are gonna be the means of the distribution of means for each of those. The T value for the test, and that's essentially something like how many Z scores away from the mean it is the is the outlier population is 20. From that we would say it is highly unlikely that these are drawn from the same population. And because of what we're saying that population should be stable if our research hypothesis is true. In this case, we reject the research hypothesis that the cephalic index is stable. We say, no, it changes. Therefore, race theory upon which H1 is based is not supported. Now, race theory didn't have a lot of support by the 19-teens when Boas is finally doing this work and it's published in 1916. Um, so this is seen as one of the nails in the coffin of race theory and from that sort of the birth of anthropology as we understand it today in which we focus on culture and environment rather than race to try and understand variation and that's why this study is so important. It's also great because we have great data and can do all kinds of fun stuff in statistics classes with it. But this is what Boaz found, and I hope this is a nice example of a t-test, and if we want to look at this difference, these are the foreign-born individuals, uh, U.S.-born individuals in gray, foreign-born in dark blue, and you can see that this is different. The two are slightly different. Okay? If we look back, U.S.-born individuals have slightly longer heads than foreign-born ones, we'd say, does this act, does this difference actually matter that much? Well, it's a pretty small difference, but it does matter in terms of if the the two populations are stable, or if cephalic index is stable between the two, because it's not, it changes. And actually looking at subpopulations and some of them it changes very, very dramatically, and that leads us to next time because next time we're going to be talking about the analysis of variance, or ANOVA, and we can look at subpopulations here and their differences. So we're going to do that next time. We'll see you then.